As Election Day nears, a special partnership works to improve voter access in underserved communities. I don't think it's by accident that King County saw a 76% turnout in our midterm election. They march, stomp, and shimmy. Performing is their passion, but the real takeaway are the lessons learned. Deep within the market, a small storefront opens to a world where cherished work becomes a work of art. The book is such a wonderful way to tell a story. It's hard to beat it. These stories and more next on City Street. I'm Tata Vikaprikian and welcome to City Stream from De Laurenti Food and Wine. At the grand entrance to Pike Place Market, this popular spot welcomes people from all over the world. For locals, it's been a mainstay for more than 70 years. This store was established in 1946 when a young Peter De Laurenti returned to Seattle from Torino, Italy. It's known for its specialty meats, cheeses, and wines. And with October being Italian American Heritage Month, it's fitting we're here. More on De Laurenti's in a bit. With Election Day less than three weeks away, there's an ongoing effort in Seattle and King County to help turn out the vote in underserved communities. Brian Callanan shows us the important work being done by the Voter Education Fund. It's easy to not even notice the nondescript Community Justice Center on 4th Avenue South in Seattle. But Reverend Jimmy James says this office, which helps offenders who are re-entering the community, demands your attention. Most people want to come out and they are serious about changing their lives. Well, I just want to give you a, a little bit of information. James is executive director of a program called BEST, being empowered through supportive transitions. Had, had you ever voted before? No, I haven't. The Department of Corrections has asked us not to identify the people James is talking to. People transitioning back to the community following a prison term and a period of state supervision. Understand and know, educate them about their right to vote. Part of that transition includes understanding that in our state, the voting rights offenders lose after committing a felony are restored once state supervision is completed. Reverend James is trying to impact a challenging trend. The state says of those released from prisons in 2014, Nearly one in three returned to prison within three years. That right and go ahead and vote. Most definitely. James helps people file re-registration paperwork and receive a ballot. A civil right many of us take for granted bears a deep significance for those who've served time and those who haven't. It makes our community more whole when everyone gets that true second chance to be a member of society. Well, basically everybody has a voice. Thomas, not his real name, was confused about losing his voting rights and hopes the work of programs like BEST can help educate others who may see their past conviction as a permanent block from the ballot box. I think if maybe people get like more knowledge out there, then people, more people will come out and vote. It could make a huge difference. It's part of a larger issue for corrections specialist Cynthia Softly whose mother, growing up in the South, lived through the Civil Rights Movement. She drank from the colored fountain. She rode the back of the bus. She went to a segregated school. Softly, a teacher for the DOC's behavioral intervention classes, says programs like BEST are tearing down some walls we may not even be aware we're putting up. Once people pay their debt to society, then they should have the right to vote. If it becomes too difficult for people to figure out how to vote, then sometimes people give up. The BEST program is one of dozens supported by the Voter Education Fund, a partnership between King County Elections and the Seattle Foundation. So if you vote or you don't, you're still going to be impacted by the decisions that are a part of the process. So if you are an eligible voter, it's incredibly important to vote. Jonathan Cunningham is program officer for the Community Programs Team at the Foundation, a nonprofit that, with King County, is putting a million dollars into the Voter Education Fund. 
to reach out to communities with traditionally low voter turnout. I vote. I vote. Longhouse Media's I Vote program, connecting with indigenous people, is one of 40 grantees that last year alone contacted nearly 80,000 people across King County and registered more than 7,000 to vote. We want to be able to fund organizations that can do culturally relevant, culturally specific voter outreach and voter education, always nonpartisan. And we want to make sure that everyone who can vote, can vote. Native peoples have something to say. Filmmaker Tracy Rector says she's working to rebuild trust for Native Americans in federal and local governments by empowering her people and helping them find a voice in our political system. Voter registration education shouldn't necessarily be this like labor or this heavy lift. But it's like, yeah, I get a vote and make a difference. And the Voter Education Fund is making a difference, says King County Elections Director Julie Wise. I don't think it's by accident that King County saw a 76% turnout in our midterm election. What we're really looking at That's well above a 50% turnout nationally. And Wise, who also champions postage paid voting by mail and same day voter registration, says the Voter Education Fund is another tool to make sure all of our voices are heard. We're really actively removing barriers for our voters. It really should be as easy as possible for all of us to participate in democracy all of us. It's the definition of democracy, power to the people, a power that with the help of the Voter Education Fund is growing stronger, one ballot at a time. Everybody deserves the chance to change something important in their life. The more people who are participating in society is better for everyone. If you'd like to learn about more ways you can help get out the vote, just go to the King County Elections website at kingcounty.gov and click on Voter Education Fund. Next on CityStream, talk about making an entrance. Meet the inspiration behind the Dolls and Gents Drill Team, a team with enthusiasm and a winning attitude. Every summer I'm just excited because I'm in a parade. Welcome back from De Laurentiis at the Market. Not far from here, the city comes alive each summer as the torchlight parade winds through town. And one group that dazzles the crowd with their eye-catching routines is the Dolls and Gents Drill Team and Drumline. It was started by two women who drilled with the same team growing up, and now their daughters are carrying on the tradition. Diane Duthweiler has their story. I need everyone to please line up now. Attention! I still get butterflies every time they perform. We wanted our name on it, wanted our stamp on it, wanted our, our swag. When we go out there, it's showtime. And we had envisioned that hadn't been seen in Seattle. That was good, you guys! We have so much fun. Like sisters, cousins, best friends, whatever you want to call it. We're like sister, best friends, cousins. You know, just been knowing her for years. We trust each other. It's like she's literally like my left hand. One more time, five, six. Some people on the team are family. Others just think they are. My mom's been telling me that she's my cousin for like all my life. And then I finally figured out that she's not my cousin. Me and Jayla hang out a lot. Um, we're close in age, like really close in age, and we have a lot in common. She's uh, my god sister, but we feel like, I feel like she's my sister. You can't blame Jayla for being confused. She and Malia have been marching with the dolls and gents since they can remember. To see them both 11 and 12 now, going to 6th and 7th grade, it mirrors me and Jamila. It's very important for our children to be a part of um, an organization where they see children that look like them. I met Makisa when we were in Sweet Mahogany. So I think I was six, she probably was about five, so. <laughs> we would play drill team outside on the, um, 
on the porch, um, across the street. I mean, anywhere we could, we were making up steps. We went to different middle schools, but of course we were in drill team. So we see each other on the weekends and on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Fridays and Saturdays. <laughs> and then we um, went to Garfield together. A few years after graduation, we were helping with Sweet Mahogany drill team initially. And then we decided, you know, let's just go ahead and do our own thing. We thought we would only get 25 girls. We were going to be happy with 25. We got 100 within the first two days. And we were like, what are we going to do? Let's try that again. Five, six, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Better. She'll wake up in the middle of the night. Hey, I got something. Boom, 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 pop. And I'm like, what is that supposed to mean? <laughs> Sassy and classy is what we always say. OK, but I have to see it. She throws these creative ideas out in the middle of nowhere and it ends up working. This community is like sisters, so like you build it together. A lot of the kids had never even traveled before and we've taken them on their first trips. Drill team was the first time I flew on an airplane. My first trip was Disneyland. Astoria, Oregon with our drill team. We slept in a barn. We wanted to give those same opportunities that we had to these youth as well. Yeah, it takes a lot of time, effort, energy. Teaching them the importance of time management. Leadership, being a leader, not a follower. Accountability. Helping others. Student first. The future with college. Going to college is not a bad idea. Every summer I'm just excited because I'm in a parade. I like the parades. I love to make people smile. People like to cheer for us. I have two favorite, Chinatown and Torchlight. I hear a drill team coming. Do you? Here they come. Oh and with this the torchlight the comes the spotlight. Come. This is the award-winning Dolls and Jets drill team at Drumline. The parade is broadcast live all over the region by Cairo 7 Television. I am ready. I'm so ready. They will get you on your feet. Let's watch. We have to all stay together and not, you know, get mad at each other and stuff. I try to deliver positive energy and good leadership, making sure everybody's included, like family. As long as you're like grooving with the beat, you know, enjoying yourself, it just feels like a breeze. So much fun. It's like you turn into a whole different person when you put on the uniform. Dolls and Jets drill team. Torchlight may be big, but it's not the end. One last stop in Seattle for Lake City's Summer Festival and Parade. This is your last year being a baby doll. Are you going to try your best? Yeah! GG! Show. We just dance, we just have fun, it's all good vibes. Oh, you guys, good job! No, why are you still doing this? Why are you still doing this? This is 14 years, and every time Makisa and I say, okay, one more year. And then when we say one more year, and then we look and say, but what are all these kids gonna do? Dolls model on three! One, two, three! We're still going, <laughs> almost 15 years later. To hold my hand and to hold my heart. I am the Dolls Drill Team for a dream start. One fun fact, Makisa and Jamila say the Northwest loves a parade. This corner of the country has more parades than nearly anywhere else in America. If you'd like to learn more about this outstanding team, just go to their website, thedollsdrillteam.org. Welcome back to City Stream from De Laurenti Food and Wine here at Pike Place Market. I'm here with one of the co-owners here, Matt Snyder. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. You guys are really busy today and probably every day being in this location. Is this pretty typical? Uh, it is. Um, summertime is crazy 
the holidays you're even more crazy and uh, for us the busier the better. And fall too when everyone's kind of wanting to fall, cook indoors yeah. and come get I their mean, ingredients. Any, anything that involves bringing people together and eating is positively correlated to the number of people in the store to eat said food. You're here obviously in front of the main grand entrance into Pike Place Market right on First Avenue. You must get not only tourists but a lot of locals, people speaking yeah. all kinds of languages. Yeah. Give me an idea of the kind of people that kind of come through here. There is no end to the diversity, um, not just being in downtown Seattle but welcoming people from all four corners of the world. Um, uh, Northwest customers, local customers that are cooking dinner at home, uh, people grabbing the quota of two bottles of wine to take aboard a ship to go to Alaska, um, people coming for lunch. Uh, it just is all day, every day from everywhere. It's great. What do you notice when they taste some of that authentic Italian food? Their eyes roll back in their heads and no, no. So, um, you know, we're fortunate enough to have great things that appeal to a lot of people and I guess that maybe the, the, the greatest treasure is exposing people to things that they haven't had before. People coming from another part of the country, they wander in here like this and then we put food in front of them and they eat it and they, you, you see the light go on and you're like, they'll be back. Tell me a little bit about the food you do have here. Of course you're known for your meats and cheeses and wine. There's a cafe upstairs that's very reasonably priced too. What are some of your favorites? What are some of the customers' favorites? Yeah, well every, everybody has their own favorites, um, which is the reason why we have so many different things. Um, there's a lot of things that you can find elsewhere, but a lot of things that you can't find in other places, which um, a lot of things that don't make it onto regular grocery store shelves, like little tiny bottles of distilled, if you take a thousand anchovies and distill them down into a ting, single little bottle, that, that's like this important to this many people, but like this important to this many people. Unfortunately, there's enough of them to come into the store and really enjoy grabbing those things. Give us an idea of what's on the menu at the cafe. What can people come grab? Oh my gosh, great uh, soup, salad, sandwiches, um, pizza, specials, fried chicken on Fridays today, which is, we're not known for that yet, but uh, if you come down and have a fried chicken sandwich, we will be, I guarantee it. What's your favorite? You said prosciutto or burrata? Prosciutto like? di parma, uh, burrata, grilled bread, glass of rosé, like, I'm good. Nothing gets better right. than that, right? right. Uh, very few things are better than that, yes. Tell me a little bit about the history of this place. You took over from the De Laurenti family about 18 years ago. Yeah. How important was it for you to preserve that family heritage? Oh, it was vital. Um, Lou De Laurenti, uh, the son of the original owner, Pete De Laurenti, started the uh, business in 1946. Um, and for the longest time was the only place you could get anything imported from Italy or Europe uh, in the Pacific Northwest in Seattle. So. Um, a lot of people have had a, a relationship with the store for a lot longer than we have been here, than any of us have been working here. You see uh, generations of people come in um, and we're so fortunate to get to have the opportunity to carry it forward and preserve that and hopefully build on that. What makes you stand out? Uh, I think that it's a warm, welcoming um, atmosphere with a lot of things that people have seen and whether you even intend on buying anything or you're just aimlessly walking around there's things to see things to taste um, great smells to smell visuals everywhere so it's it's a uh, it's a wonderful place to be it's like a small Italian museum is how you put it uh, yeah um, it's an Italian American European museum. We don't discriminate um, on uh, the types of food. We have our origin in Italian food, but there's food from all over, from down the street to everywhere in the world, too. So. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Matt Snyder, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. This month's also Italian Heritage Month, so it's the perfect opportunity to come down to Pike Place Market and check out De Laurenti Food and Wine right here on First Avenue. We'll be right back. In a city that loves to read, meet a publisher with a deep appreciation of content and an appealing cover. That's next on City Street.
If you wander through the lower levels of the market, you'll come across a bookstore and a publisher with an eye for visual beauty. Chin Music Press began as a publisher of translated tales from Japan, then branched out to local histories and artist retrospectives. As Ian DeVere reveals, it has a reputation for making books that are both beautiful to look at and to read. I was an English lit major. Uh, I love reading books all the time. Um, they've changed my life, you know, and the way I think. Books are a, a little universe in itself. It's, it's such a simple thing, right? It has, it has a cover and a back. It's got some pictures maybe, some artwork. I love the turning of the pages. Every part of the book has to be treasured, but it's a huge collaboration. After spending about 15 years in Japan as a journalist, I worked for the Nikkei Shimbun, and Yuko worked for a wire service, Knight Ritter Financial News. So we were in Tokyo uh, through the 90s. I thought it was a natural progression of where our careers were as reporters, and we were transitioning out of that. We had just started a family, and when Bruce expressed an interest in all the, I guess, stories that had been written about contemporary Japan, I thought it was a great idea. We had a hunch that actually if you made the book right, it would have staying power, and I think that's proven to be true. You know, let's get rid of the step. Yeah. Never mind. We first started it with a, a designer and, um, who was working in Tokyo, an American guy, Craig Maud, and uh, he was very influential in helping us get this, the aesthetics of, of our press. First book, um, Kuhaku, that was really the book that got us into the publishing business. That book was really well made. Uh, the cover was nice and had texture on it. Just this canvas-like feel and it had this nice embossing. The design of the pages and the layout were great bringing back that old tradition of creating material that is a pleasure to read but also a joy to touch. So my brother is a professor of literature and uh, after August 29th, 2005, he went to Houston and realized he was going to be in exile for a while so he came here. And over the first few days when he was in mourning over his city, uh, we got the idea to put together a book called Do You Know What It Means to Miss New Orleans? And we reached out to everyone he knew um, and we created a book in the narrative shape of a jazz funeral. And it changed for me what this company was about and, and, and connected us with a part of the country where we've done um, you know, many books with writers down there. And it sort of opened us up to exploring what was around us. It opened us up to doing books about Seattle. We're sitting on this gold mine. There's so much going on in Seattle. And if we don't turn our awareness towards those stories, I feel like we're missing out big time. I guess the first one we did that was local was Shiro because he had this amazing treasure trove of photographs. So we turned it into kind of a visual memoir. And also there's a cookbook element to it too. That whole story became such a great history of Seattle through sushi. You know, it's easier for me to get behind something that's uh, got a great nonfiction tale about Seattle. people come in, how are they supposed to know what they're stepping into? And how are people across the country supposed to know like how these cities that are changing and that have had such messy patterns of growth, um, how do we tell the stories about how people live together? We never anticipated this much interest in the book, but the story is about the civil rights movement in, this, in the Seattle area during the 60s, 70s, 80s, and even until today. So, you know, the Gang of Four, their legacy was, uh, was a great one to tell. And Dean's sort of man in the street interviews and photos, those, those are the natural ones for us. You want somebody who loves your work to do your book. The major publishers that I talked to, they didn't really have that interest. They want you to prove yourself to them and why you're important, you know. Whereas uh, Chin Music saw the importance. We try to make each book a, a project. 
And so Ken's book, for example, he's an up and coming artist, especially when we started working on the book, it just seemed right. Having a book really helped kickstart my career. Uh, it brought me to a lot more um, different people that wouldn't have seen my work. It widened my audience. I started getting fans from all over the world after that. I always felt that this, this company should be like a, a place to propel voices or artists, kind of like with chin music being a baseball phrase, um, almost like a triple A team helping that, that new artist get that launch onto a bigger platform. I find it apt that Chin Music Press is located on the third floor of the Pike Place Market. You have to find it. When you find it though, that floor is amazing because it's where all the stuff that's hidden is. It was always in the back of my mind, a, a physical space. I would like the look of the store to represent what our press is. And I wanted also to showcase a lot of our colorful works from our artists the designers and illustrators and photographers we work with and kind of a celebration of the whole process. It's really collaborative, it's really kind of decentralized. You have a voice here. Um, I think whether you're a member of the staff or whether you're an author. And certainly with Ken or even with um, sushi chef Shiro Kashiba or other people, it just felt like they deserve this book to tell their story uh, more completely. The book is such a wonderful way to tell a story and it's hard to beat it. If you'd like to learn more about the publisher's current list of projects, just visit chinmusicpress.com. We'll be right back. That wraps up this week's episode of City Stream from De Laurenti Food and Wine here at Pike Place Market. If you'd like to learn more about the products they have here and even order online, just visit their website, delaurenti.com. I'm Tadavika Prikyan. Thank you for watching. <laughs>